Why don't you give me a sign? Like the sea that leaves a trail along that shore It's not your problem, it's mine Everybody thinks that I'm okay Sometimes I think I am too I'm on the outside looking in I'm waiting for the shockwaves to begin Oh, won't you let me hold you for one time Just a rainy day In a London cafe A London cafe One last job. Rodents don't live very long without us. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. How you doing? Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Really good. Glad you got in okay. Yeah, it was. In, I don't know why it wouldn't let me in. It was uh, bizarre. It just kept, 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 could I put a passcode in or something? So yeah, <laughs> that's that's it. Well, anyway, it's fixed now. Right, okay, yeah, we're here. <laughs> we're here, right. Yeah. Let's get ready. <laughs> okay. So, hello, my name is Aoife and I'm from the fan carpet and it's nice to be talking to you today. Yeah, you too. Lovely, lovely. So, um, the first question is, what made you get into the industry, the entertainment industry to begin with? What was the defining moment that kind of said, look, this is for me? Um, well, I'm, I think I've I've always liked um, movies from you know probably a young age, um, but I never thought I'd end up you know being an actual producer. So I think essentially what happened was um, I I've, I just got a random call out of the blue. I, I I used to run clubs all around the world, so I'd sold my business, and I was just sort of at a loose end, really not really knowing what to do. And then someone just rang me up out of the blue and said, "Oh, I'm making a film. Do you want to be in it?" So me being me, I was like, yeah, why not? I've, I've got nothing else to do. So, um, yeah. I did a little bit on this film, and there was people like Martin Hancock, um, Scott Welsh, who'd just done Snatch, um, Andy Beckwith, who'd just done Snatch. So there was there was some people in there that, I, you know, Billy Murray, who was obviously on the bill for a number of years. Um, so I was sort of a bit sort of blown away that I'm actually in a film with these people. And... Uh, I got chatting to him after a couple of days and said, um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, become an actor? And they said, well, you've already done your first job. And he, obviously, you know, that, that's the hardest thing to do, you know, is to get a job. Um, so he said, if, if I was you, I'd just get some pictures done. And, um, you know, write to um, a few agents, say you've got a show reel and you're looking for representation. So I sort of went home and uh, my wife, who was eight months pregnant, <laughs> Um, I told her the good news. She wasn't obviously that, that supportive <laughs> of the fact that I'm at 31 years of age, I was going to become an actor, and she thought I was I'd gone mad. Um, and um, I got an agent. I then got a bit uh, a little part in EastEnders for a couple of episodes. Then I did what all jobbing actors do, you know, a little bit of theatre, my family, um, you know, the bill. Um, and then after about a year, I was like, I don't really want to do this because you know, you get an audition, you don't get the job, mm. um, you get the job and then, you know, you, you get a couple of days work or weeks work and you don't work for six months. So I just thought this, and when I looked into it, I sort of found out that 95% of all actors are unemployed. So if, yeah. I, if I'd yeah. known that in the beginning, I probably wouldn't have uh, taken it up as a career. Um, and then I was with a friend of mine and we just was chatting and and, and I said to him, you know, um, he said, oh, where's the acting going? I said, well, to be honest, I said, I think I made a mistake here. I've sold my business yeah. and I've gone into being an actor and uh, I'm not in Hollywood yet and I've been doing it a year. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> well, um, you know, you, you, what do you want to do? And I said, I really want to do movies. And he said, well, look, you've been organising events for 20,000 people. So how hard is it to do, put together a movie? And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. So I said, I'm going to find a script and I'm going to put some money. Will you put some money? And he went, yeah. So I ended up finding a script, finding a director, finding some actors, uh, rang all my mates up and said, let's make a movie. It'd be a laugh. 
essentially crowdfunded it through my mates, um, made the film. And that was really like going to film school. That was our not to make a movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what that did was it like, opened up. Everybody then went, oh, Terry's making movies now. And obviously, because everyone knew me from putting on these events, so I had a massive net network of people. Yeah. And then people started coming out of Woolworths saying, oh, I've got an idea for a movie. This guy's written a book, blah, blah, blah. And we had a, a run of two great movies, um, Rolling with the Nines, which got BAFTA nominated and won Rain Dance. And that was probably the first um, urban sort of boys in the hood type film. Um, and, um, you know, that was my second movie. Um, and then after that, obviously, we had a book called Muscle, which was um, the basis for Rise of the Foot Soldier. We developed that script. Um, and then obviously that was one of the biggest British crime films of all time. It's now a, a Britain's only true crime film franchise. So, um, yeah, so out of, you know, just being in a movie for a laugh to, um, you know, doing a couple of little acting parts on on, on EastEnders, The Bill and uh, My Family, I ended up getting into producing movies as well as it started yeah. in them. So um, after that, we did a film with Doghouse called Sony, Sorry, we, we did a film with Sony called Doghouse, which was like a comedy horror. And then um, from there, just sort of sat my own company. Um, you know, I think I've done, produced 32 films. I've been in 35 as an actor. So I've, I've, over the last 20 years, I've, I've racked up some impressive credits. I've worked with all the studios, done a lot of stuff with Netflix and Amazon. Um, so, yeah, no, it's um, from... from from working in McDonald's to where I am now, I think I've done all right. <laughs> yeah, you've done pretty good for yourself, all right. How have you feel the industry has changed? I know everything has been sort of changing in a lot of industries in the last few years. Are yeah. you liking the direction it's going? I'm sure it's pretty different from when you began. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, from from a selfish perspective, I'm over the moon about <laughs> it because, uh, because, because as an independent film producer, mm -hmm. Unless you break through and, you know, get a lucky break um, or create something that wins Oscars and BAFTAs, um, you know, you're always going to be the sort of little little girl, the little girl or whatever. You, ne you never never really get, you know, taken seriously. And I think the, um, the, 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 the power was with the cinemas. You know, the cinemas are like, well, if you want to put your film in the cinemas, you've got to put it on so many hundred screens. You've got to put all this money behind it. Obviously, as an independent, you know, we 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 were lucky in that one of the films that we released was was via Paramount, and we had the opportunity to 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 back it, you know, in the cinemas. And um, the problem is the cinema chains um, are like mercenary. So as soon as the film comes out, if it doesn't do what they want it to do, they just take it off. And then back then, you had a four month window where you had to sit and wait for four months before you could release it on DVD. Blu-ray, digital, you know, you, you had to wait four months. But then obviously in four months, it's such a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's forgotten about your film. So then you had to go and spend another load of money. So when you actually look at the costs of releasing a film um, in, you know, 2000 and set in the 2007 to 2020, and you look at them now, it's like a fraction. It's probably 8% of the cost. And, and the reason I'm happy about that is because as, as an independent, I no longer need the cinemas. I no yeah. longer need, um, you know, to put money into putting adverts on tubes and buses and TV and radio ads. No one watches them, right? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, everybody has, has got one of these, right? And um, what the way the world's going, and whether you like it or not, this is how it is, um, the metaverse is going to become a reality. And people are now watching content on their phones, their devices, their computers, their laptops, their iPads, more than they are. In, they're not. In, no one's interested in going to the cinema. You know, it's, it's yeah. prohibit, prohibitively expensive. And I think if there's an event film where Mission Impossible or Disney or, you know, and I'm talking about a £200 million film, that is worth going to the cinema for. But I think the days of... Uh, releasing 12 films in a multiplex and people just queuing up buying popcorn and sweets, I think that's over. And I think COVID um, basically, you know, ended that model um, and it accelerated their model. And obviously their model is 
digital. So, you know, all the stuff that we create or we have created is aimed at a specific audience. And most of these people are, are on their devices, laptops. They're 15 to 35. So, you know, for me as a producer, it allows me to get to these people, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot easier than I was able to before. Um, and obviously it doesn't cost as much money. So that therefore means if I make a film um, on a low budget, I've got more chance of the, the investors making their money back and, 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 and the creatives making money because of the way the model's changed. But it's only changed, um, it, it, I'd say probably September 2021, when the world restarted, um, you know, I think that was uh, that was when, you know, people started going, well, do you know what? It's a bit like this work from home stuff, right? Yeah. You know, if you work work for a company and someone says to you, you can sit home and work, and you haven't got to go into London, and you haven't got to buy coffees and lunches and drinks and whatever, um, you, you look at your, your pay slip and you think, well, I'm five or 10 grand or 20 grand a year better off, right? So then when they say, well, it's time to come back to the office now, nobody wants to go back to the office. And I don't blame them because, you know, it, it, everybody's been sort of, you know, educated that, you know, you can work from home, right? You, you know, and it's the same thing, you know, everybody watched Netflix, everyone watched Amazon, everyone subscribed to all these platforms. People consume probably more content via their devices and their televisions than they've ever consumed ever, right? So obviously it's like behavior, you know, if you go to the pub every Friday and drink 10 pints, you're probably going to do that for the rest of your life. So if you get, you know, educated in the, you know, let's get, let's have a movie night, you know, let's watch yeah. Elvis, right? You, you know, Elvis comes out in the cinema, you can go and watch it and spend hundred quid and, and get 50, 50 quid on popcorn and drinks and stuff. Or you can sit home with your family and go, do you know what? There's six of us in the house. We'll get a takeaway. We'll have a bottle of wine and we'll watch Elvis, right? It's probably a quarter of the price, right? Or half the price. So people then say, well, actually let's do that. We don't need to go to the cinema. We've got a 50 inch TV. So, I think in the old days when you had these little 14 inch TVs and the cinema was this like, I mean, I used to go to the cinema three times a week. You know, it was three pounds, right? Yeah, and I yeah. used to get a hot dog, a cura, a cinema <laughs> ticket. So for me, that was great value. And I used to drive my mum and dad up the wall for, for three pounds so I could go to the cinema. And, you know, I've got three children. I've got a, an eight year old, 15 year old, 19 year old. They're not interested in the cinema. They, they, they might want to go and see Black Panther. They might want to go and see Mission Impossible or Top Gun. But I'd say as a family, you know, my kids beg me to go to the cinema twice or three times a year. Um, and, and, you know, they're quite, and I, I, I've actually asked them, you know, I like obviously do market research and said, um, you know, why don't you, um, you know, want to do this stuff? And they said, well, it's simple. He said, you know, we're, we're happy to watch it on their devices. And I used to, if I used to go anywhere and see people watching films on a phone, I always used to get annoyed and just think that's not how it's supposed to be consumed. But unfortunately, that's just how it's gone now. And uh, all the content that we're creating is perfect for that market. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said earlier, th the only reason I'm happy about the way it's going is because, you know, the direct to consumer movement's happening. We're able to, you know, the last heist. Um, was a film um, that was financed and produced and edited in lockdown, right? So that mm -hmm. is a film that's come out of COVID, just like Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, yeah. the film that came out of COVID. Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins has been a massive success. Um, the last heist, again, we looked at it and we said, well, actually, in the UK, what is the point of going through, you know, a distributor? Because, um, you know, you've got, um, the DVD market's dead. Yeah. Um, you know, the theatrical market is a waste of money because people aren't going to go and watch, a, you know, if you've got a choice to go and watch Black Panther or The Last Heist, you know, you've got a small, low-budget independent film or that you've got a 200 million pound film. We're not going to be able to take on Black Panther. So for us, it's sort of like, well, why don't we do a, a film premiere? Why don't we put it in, you know, some limited cinemas, which we've done? And why don't we... Um, release it on all platforms. So every single person in this country on Monday can watch a movie, right? They can rent yeah, it, they can yeah. buy it, they can download it, they can have it in standard def, high def. And, you know, we decided we'd do it ourselves. And, you know, the, 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 I think there's going to be a, a, a real movement. I think, obviously, with the streaming platforms like the Netflixes and Amazons, 
and the TV broadcasters, obviously dealing, doing business with them. Um, you know, I've, I've, my last 10 films have been released by Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Um, they've been on Apple. They've been on all these platforms. So I'm a massive fan of the streamers and the broadcasters, but I just think, unfortunately, um, the cinemas, um, you know, have, 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 have had their day. And I think the cinemas will still exist, but I think people will either want to go to a cinema and sit in a luxury seat, have a bottle of wine, have a nice meal, or sit in an IMAX, or sit in a, uh, I think they call them 4D cinemas, where the, the chairs move and there's smells and, you know, noises. Um, so it becomes an experience rather yeah. than just queuing up for some popcorn. And um, I think, you know, if you go into Leicester Square, I think the View, I think Cineworld, I think Odeon, they've already adopted this. But unfortunately, you know, when we're talking about the mass market and when I talk about cinemas, I'm talking about the multiplexes with the 12 screens, you know, with the bowling yeah. alley and the restaurants. I think that's unfortunately going to be difficult. Yeah. That's interesting um, here on that point of view, because I always feel like nowadays um, that people's attention span has gotten shorter. So I feel people are kind of liking shorter content. I don't know if you've you yeah. noticed that. And, you know, they flick through TikTok and sort of Instagram yeah. and stuff and they can't hold their attention. I know it's given, of... it's, TikTok's given everybody ADHD. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah. But I, I feel yeah. like then I've heard people complain about movies that are longer. You know, people are like, right. oh, I can't watch a three hour movie, you know, right. no, no matter how much of a masterpiece it is. Have yeah. you sort of found that yourself? Yeah. Or... I mean, to be honest, I mean, all, their, all the films we make are anywhere between an hour and 20, 25 minutes to, you know, I think I think an hour 40 is probably the longest. Um, uh, I mean, look, I've, I watched The Irishman on Netflix. I thought that was a great movie. Yeah. But again, yeah. I thought it was a, a bit long. You know, The mm -hmm. Dark Knight, again, a great movie, but I thought it was a bit long. But I've grown up watching three-hour movies. So for me, I've still got that attention span. But um, I think it's a little bit like when you advertise something now, you you know in the old days you needed like three or four months run up to, yeah. to get in people's heads. Now it's like it's in your head. Where do I press? I want to buy it. Where what do I press? What button do I press? If there's no button to press, you've lost them and they're on to something else. So I think um I think it's I think there's 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 pros and cons to it. I think the the cons are um obviously you know you've you you kind of it's it's very you've got to create something controversial. You've got to create something yeah. that people talk about. And whether they and you know um, somebody reviewed the last heist the other day and it did make me laugh because they were saying, oh you know it's people swearing and it's violent and blah blah blah. And you know why do why do people make these films? And I'm thinking you know pe the people that um, reading that review will probably go oh you know I'm, I don't want to watch that film that's not my type of movie but other people go oh, I love that film I'm gonna go and watch yeah. that. Right? <laughs> So, so, you know, we're not making movies. I'm not interested in something pat me on the back um, with, with, you know, with with silk pyjamas on and a cravat telling me how wonderful I am. I want people to watch my movies, you know what I mean? So yeah. Um, yeah. I think with um, with all the stuff that we're doing, um, we're not making films, uh, you know, for awards or because we want, you know, to be liked by the critics. We're, we're making films for audiences. And, um, you know, I mean, look, all the films that we've made that have been on Netflix and Amazon, have all been in the top five, right? So we're obviously doing something, right? And the films that we're making are a fraction of the price of what a lot of these studios and um, bigger production companies are making. So um, I definitely think, you know, airtime's sort of now, really. And I think over the next couple of years, when you see the content that we're pushing out, you know, it's it's uh, it's definitely, you know, going to resonate with people. And it, it's... I, th I think, you know, when you make something, you need something that's different. You need something that has a twist in it. You need something that people talk about. And I think, I, I, look, it sounds really easy, right? It's like, you know, mm. baking a cake. but <laughs> It's a little bit more difficult than that. But um, I think that's uh, that's what you have to tr yeah. try and do now because obviously, you know, there's not that much content being made. And the content that is being made is being made. A lot of it is being made by committee. And um, I think that's also one of the, the, the big issues for the broadcasters and the streamers, you know, they, because they're 
you know, big companies, they have to be diverse. They have mm -hmm. to, um, you know, if they green light anything or put money into anything, they have to make sure it ticks all of their boxes. With, with us, yeah, obviously, yeah. we we're independent. So yeah, we can make a film on anything we like. Um, and in a way, it's 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 probably quite good for us um, because we're offering people alternative content. You know, because yeah. if you turn the television on, if you turn on a lot of the um, yeah, and you see a lot of the, if you look at the big the big movies, you know the. They're, they're, they're formulaic, you know, they tick a lot of the boxes, you know, there's either a, a good guy and a bad guy, you know, um, so so with us, we, you know, I think I think when you're creative, um, you you make something um, that, you know, you, you, you either want to tell a story or you've read something and you think actually this is a good story and you want to, you want to put that out there, but obviously if it doesn't tick the boxes, um, you know, a lot of people, were very, you know, they they didn't like Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins because one of the critics complained because in the scene, in the film, sorry, there was a scene where a guy and a, and a girl have an argument and she calls him whatever, whatever, and then he calls her whatever, whatever, and then she's just saying to him, and then he picks up a, a, a pool ball and throws it and it hits her on the head and she falls over and then she gets up and then she says something else. Now, when that film premiered, that was probably got the most laughs out of all of yeah, the yeah. and the whole film, and it and it was funny, but it was it, it was comedy. It's like slapstick. It's not like they didn't want to promote violence against women. It was mm -hmm. just literally a funny scene, and in context, you know, it was funny, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. um, and then people were going, oh, you know, this is outrageous and blah blah. But the thing is, um, if that had been funded by broadcast or stream or studio, they'd have gone, well, you can't really have a guy throwing a pool ball at a girl's head, you know, because it's violence against women. And they're worried that somebody's going to be offended by the it. Offended, yeah. And that they're going to lose their jobs because they've mm -hmm. allowed this to go through. And in, in 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 reality, I think if you look at older films, right? Lock, Stock, Snatch, you, you look at a lot of these films, you know, and if you look at today, people, you know, they've, they've started to put these warnings on these films saying, you know, there might you might be triggered by yeah. watching this because there's a guy calls a woman a bad name or a woman hits a guy in the face with something you know but you know what people need to understand is this is just entertainment it's not real life it's not um nobody's going to watch these films and actually think oh that that you know people really go around doing that to people um yeah. but i think i think people have taken I, I think on a creative side a lot of um creatives are essentially making stuff that isn't true to their vision. So I think in a way, all the stuff that we've created in the past five years has all been, you know, we haven't had any interference. We haven't ticked any boxes. We've just made a film which we've liked and we thought, you know, other people would like. And, you know, um, Netflix released Once Upon a Time in London, you know, worldwide. Um, you know, Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins has gone around the world. You know, it's gone out in Australia, New Zealand, Germany. South Korea even bought it, which is bizarre. Yeah. Um, and uh, Hulu released it in America and Canada. So I think, um, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, you can create content um, and people will release it and people will enjoy it. And, uh, you know, just because the critics don't like something doesn't mean that, you know, everybody else um, will sort of fall into line just because the critics don't like it because of X, Y, Z, you know. Yes, yes. So you've touched on that there, that there's a lot of, you know, people people getting offended by certain things now in movies that they sort of weren't before, as you mentioned, with the bad language and stuff like that. And I feel like it is affecting sort of the content in movies and sort of mm. the the realistic sort of portrayal of what actually happens in life. So you find that yourself, that there is sort of a, a sort of trend to be more sort of sensitive around the topics yeah. That but if you look that. at if you look at people, right? If you look mm -hmm. at Amazon, look at yeah, Amazon yeah. as an yeah, example, yeah. right? Amazon's got 12.6 million customers in England, right? I don't know how many people watch Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, but for it to be in the top five, it's got to be millions, right? Yeah. Same with Netflix. When Once Upon a Time in London and the Foot Soldier Marbella went on Netflix, they both charted at number three, right? Again, Netflix has got 13 million people. So it just shows you millions of people are watching these things and enjoying them for what they are. Um, and I just think, 
it's a small minority of people. Um, most of them are obviously younger people. Um, and they're sort of obviously being vocal about this stuff and saying, well, you know, um, I'm offended by this and I don't like that. And you can't say this, you can't say that. And then people are actually giving these people a voice and worrying about, you know, probably like 0.1% of the country. And you just sort of think, well, why, why, why are people allowing these people to shape the narrative? You know, when I grew up, you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm resilient because I've grew up with people calling me names, um, bantering me, um, you know, bullying me, really, mm -hmm. right? You know, because when you, when, you, when you live on a council estate, you know, that, that's just how it is. Um, but, you know, I think um, people, I, I think people should stop worrying about being offended. I mean, at, at, at schools yeah. now, people are being told it's okay not to win it's okay to come last you know it's taking part that take that that that, that takes that, that counts right and i say to all my kids i said you know if you come last in life you get zero so you know I, i'm not a massive fan of what's being taught in schools at the moment and uh i just think that you know people just need to realize i mean there was a great um thing recently in the press guy nativ who's an oscar winning director writer um he has done a film with Helen Mirren yeah. um, about Golda Meir, who's obviously a famous Jewish character. Um, and, you know, Dame Maureen Lippman came out of the woodwork and said, I'm offended by this because, you know, Helen Mirren isn't Jewish. And then Helen Mirren come back and said, well, um, you know, all the parts you've been playing in your career aren't Jewish. So by that rationale, should you not played any parts, only Jewish parts? And it does kind of make sense. So, you know, what people need to understand is actors play roles, yeah. right? And, you know, if it's a bit like um, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot. You know, if you yeah, made that brilliant. film today, yeah. they would probably say, well, you know, you, you can't really have an actor playing that. You need someone with cerebral palsy playing it, which is ridiculous because someone with cerebral palsy probably wouldn't be able to deliver that performance. And, you know, it was a moving film. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I think, you know, again, this is more stuff more nonsense from, the, you know, a small minority of people that just seem to want to sort of reshape the world, which, you know, I don't, I don't think it works. I think, you know, the majority of people, they watch films to be entertained or shocked or horrified. Um, you know, they it's entertainment, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think if, if you're going to sanitise entertainment so that, you know, you've only got, um, you know, I think, I think obviously you have to use common sense. I think, you know, if there is an actor if there was a Jewish actor that could have played Golda Meir as good as Helen Mirren, then I would say, well, yeah, definitely use a Jewish actor. Do you know what I mean? But I think if you're actually just by default saying, sorry, you're, you're the wrong color, you're, you're not disabled, you're, you know, you've got to be this, you've got to be that, you've got to be this religion. Um, I think that's, you know, I, I think if, if, if you can get somebody that's qualified to do the work, great. But if you can't, then you, you know, I mean, yeah, if you look back, you know, to, you know, in, in all the films, you know, you used to have people, you know, playing all sorts of different people in films and uh, it was never a problem. But, you know, you fast forward to 2022 and it, it just seems to be everything's a problem now. Do you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> we need to lighten up and have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Brilliant. No, that's really interesting. I do find that myself. And um, yeah, Daniel Day-Lewis, nobody could have played that better, to be honest. No, it was amazing. It's fantastic. And, and yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, but but that, that film probably would never have got made today. Today. Yeah. 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 With the last heist, did you find any of those challenges with that or was there anything that you found difficult? I think I think the challenge with the last heist was, um, I mean, the the, 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 the the original material was a play. So okay. obviously when you get a play, a play is for the stage. So obviously you're just in a room <laughs> basically. So um, the challenge was making, and, and there's a big twist in this film. Um, oh. It was selling the twist, so it's believable. And it was making the film engaging throughout. So we obviously opened up the stage play into, into a movie and we spent a lot of time, probably about five months, going backwards and forwards on the dialogue. And look, with all these things, you know, you, you, you're limited with with you know the budget and you're limited on time um if you had more time and more money you could have made it much better but i think what we've created for the money 
and for the time is unbelievable. And, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, it's already won, you know, awards at Marbella Film Festival and at the, uh, the British Independent Film Festival. We had a massive premiere in Marbella, which, you know, we had 600 people flying for, which was amazing. Um, we had a Leicester Square premiere last week, which had a thousand people there. Um, and, and we had a really good, I mean, it was, um, uh, we had lots and lots of celebrities, probably more celebrities for this one than we've had for anyone. And uh, what was nice was everybody came out of cinema saying how moved they were by the material, um, how they loved the fact that it wasn't just another gangster heist film. It was a film with a heart and it was it was funny. It was upsetting, you know, it's sort of all the all the levels, Roller you know. Coaster. So yeah. So so you know, hearing that, and and it's always better to watch a film with an audience because obviously if you watch it in a in a editing suite, you never get you've seen it so many times, you you just get sick of it. Um, but actually watch it with an audience has, has been really, really refreshing. And um, you know, I mean that film was developed, produced, edited. In COVID, so it's a it's a COVID baby basically, yeah. um, and um, you know it's 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 great for us that you know we can put this film out to everybody in England on Monday. Every, anybody anywhere can watch it on their device, their TV, their phone. Um, so you know it's very exciting for us, you know, that we're we're able to um, bring the, push the film out to everybody basically, and um, I'm sure when it's released Monday. Um, there's a lot of excitement about it already, but um, you know, I've, I've, I think, I think the, the when you ask about the challenges, I think the challenges were people kept getting COVID, like so we <laughs> we got got the film in in the can, we did it all, and then when we, as we're going through the post production process, the, the composers got COVID, the sound guys got cut, and it was just like I, I actually stood up at one point and said, everybody stop getting COVID. Do you know what I mean? It was just <laughs> annoying. Um, but, um, but, but you know, uh, now it's sort of, you know, we've got through it. But the, the good thing that come out of it, um, I actually said this to my business partner the other day, who I produced a movie with Richard Turner, and I actually said, um, what's good about it is that because we've had these delays, we've had more time to think about it, and we've come up with other ideas. Whereas if, it, if people hadn't got COVID then we'd have probably finished it quicker and then maybe it wouldn't have been as good. So I'm a great believer in sometimes when you get um, the, uh, these things, you, you know, they're, they're, it's for a reason, you know what I mean? So, uh, uh, but we've already started work on a prequel for this. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, so we've already, I, I, yeah, we already, I, I know you shouldn't, um, uh, you know, bank on a film being successful until it's released, but I think. And your chickens yeah. still the hatched. Yeah, but seeing <laughs> seeing seeing the feedback and the response and the excitement, I think when people see it, I think people are going to love it, and it is definitely going to become a another cult movie. Um, and uh, I think you know Netflix and Amazon um, will, will uh, and maybe you know some of the TV companies will buy it and uh, release it, and then you know we we're, we're, we're going to start pushing it out around the world. So um, again, that, that's uh, also really exciting, you know, to, to to have that. And then we've got another film coming out. Um, at the end of the month, because before, as I mentioned to you earlier, I used to run clubs all around the world. Rave clubs, was and, it? Uh, yeah, but yeah. but we had a brand. One of the brands was called Garage Nation, and um, we um, we did a, a documentary about the who's who of the UK garage scene. Um, and it's called Twenty Five Years of UK Garage, and um, this month is the actual twenty fifth. Uh, anniversary of that scene when it first started off. So we our movie's coming out this month. So um, again, that's another film that we another lockdown baby. So <laughs> we've uh, we've had three. Oh, good. Do you ever miss doing the music scene, or you're happier doing the acting and the producing? Yeah, I I, I do miss it. Um, but the I, I, we when we did uh, we did one because we had one nation as well. And we did a, nice. a documentary called United Nation: Three Decades of Drum and Bass, and we did a tour of the country. So we went to all these different cinemas, and we did Q and As, and uh, we had a lot of DJs. So we had Groove Rider, Fabio, Jumping Jet Frost, uh, MC Depp, Rocky, all these different characters from the sort of drum bass scene, and um, a lot of these things because it was a private screening, and it was meet me, meet these famous people watched the movie lots of people bought a ticket so we sold it out and when we went up and down the country a lot of people were saying the same thing you know why don't you make a comeback your rave's were the best 
And I said, the reason I sold the business was because all the good venues were being redeveloped into flats, houses. Yeah. And the problem is, if you've got no clubs, you've got no scene. And I think in the old days, you know, uh, you'd go out Wednesday and come back Sunday and, and there'd be, <laughs> you know, clubs, raves, after parties. There'd be all these things going on. <clears throat> and now, you know, none of that exists. So to recreate that now would be impossible. So I think I think I definitely had the best time in the 90s and the 2000s. And, and I come out of it in 2003, but I think that was the right time. And, uh, you know, again, unfortunately, um, you know, I hate to be negative, um, but similar to what's happened to cinemas, mm -hmm. it's similar to what's happening to the club scene now. And, you know, there's, I think the festivals are going to be the only gig in town. I think, you know, if you look at clubs now, if you've got a club, you know, you can't survive on it just being open once a week. You know, you need it open five five nights a week, you know, and uh, people just aren't going out. Um, again, because they either haven't got the money or they're, they're not interested, you know. I mean, I've, I've, I've actually been in restaurants and I've seen groups of like 18, 20-year-olds and they've sat on a table and it's like they've rehearsed it. They sit on the table, they all get their phones out, they all look at their phones, none yeah. of them talk. Yeah. The menu comes, they look at the menu, they order the food, go back on the phones, the food comes, eat the food, go back on the phone, get the bill, go. And, you, and I actually said to my wife, I said, um, you know, do they not talk anymore? <laughs> it's just bizarre. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, yeah, my, my son's 19 and he, he goes out occasionally, but he might go out once or twice a month. You know, I used to go out, you know, three or four times a week. So I just looking at how it was when I was younger and how it is now, I just think the whole world is changing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether it's good or bad, um, we'll, all will be revealed. But um, I definitely think the going out raving um, is is you know sort of coming to an end. An end. Yeah. And I think I think going to the cinemas, as I said, I think I think everything's changing, and I think people are going to be um, with this metaverse thing coming. I think more people are going to be, you know, playing games. I mean, my son's 15. You know, he will happily sit on his Xbox for six hours talking to his mates, playing, you know, Call of Duty or um, Fortnite or whatever they play. You know, he's quite happy to do that. And, you know, as long as he's got a packet of crisps and a can of Coke, he's sweet. Um, so, so you see that and you think, well, these people, this is, they're playing in the metaverse, right? So when... The metaverse actually becomes a thing and everyone starts going, well, you know, are people are going to work in the metaverse. I mean, it sounds absolutely nuts, right? But that's what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, you're going to be, you won't need to leave your house because you'll just put a headset on and you'll be going on the day, you you'll want, be shopping, yeah. you'll be ordering stuff off Amazon and then people will be delivering food and drinks to your house. And, and that, I think that's one of the big things of COVID. It's accelerated people spending more time at home with their families which is good good in a way um but also if you're not in a family or you're on your own it's not so good because then you're isolated so um but again the metaverse is a is a is a way of connecting you to to, to the world so at the moment it's going to be an interesting time over the next couple of years to what survives what doesn't survive what the cinemas do um obviously they've got to change what they're doing um, whether that's reducing the costs or whether it's making it more of an experience, I don't know. But I, I think the main cinema chains have already started to adopt changes to obviously give an experience and to make things better. But I just think, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to be owning a cinema chain right now looking at, because it's obviously less content. And um, if you look at the streaming platforms, again, what's happened with COVID is they've all accelerated. So Netflix has grown massively amazon's grown massively yeah. apple's grown disney's overtaken everybody so it just goes to show that that's where it's at, at the moment but again you know i'm sure something's going to come along um which disrupts everything again you know every 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 you know it was all about the cinemas then it was all about the streamers you know what's next you know something's going to come and disrupt them so um you know it'd be interesting to see what what disrupts it and and, uh, you know, how things change, you know, not just in the world, but in, in air business, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's interesting. You do worry about like 
the limited social interaction, I guess, that's kind of coming out of all of this. I think that's the most sort of worrying thing, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I I I like looking into people's eyes. You know, if someone said to me, what do you want to do? I'd quite happily sit and have a meal with somebody and actually have a conversation with them than talking to them through a headset, playing a computer game. But that's yeah. just me. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> But um, well, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Brilliant. And yeah. I thanks wish, for having us on. Of course. And I wish you all the best with everything in the future. All right. And please, God, I'll talk to you again sometime. I oh, know you will, definitely. I mean, there's uh, going to be more films coming out and more exciting things happening. So, uh, yeah, we, we'll have lots to talk about in 2023 for sure. We will indeed. <laughs> well, thanks a million, Terry. All the well, best. Thanks a lot. Thank well, you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. Never grasp. Never signed up for We're here to make bank robberies great again. <laughs>